And on top you have, I don't know, 20. And then in front of the sigma you have some, you know, something, I don't know, sine of i squared minus 4 times 82, whatever. Okay. So this is the way sigma notation works. So you have some expression here which depends on this. This is called your index variable. So i is your index variable and that's the one that changes as you go through the sum. So the way these sigmas work, or these sums work, is that you have i, or it can be r, whatever your index variable is, you start with the beginning value 0. So the sigma notation is a shorter way of writing <coughs> sums that can be very big. So if I were to write this out in full, you would write down the value for the first value. So this is the start value, that's the end value of your index. So the first value would be sine of 0 squared times 82. Just take whatever you have, and wherever you see the index variable, you put the start value. The next one, you take the start value, and you take i, and you increase it by 1. So it's from 0, it becomes 1. So you get sine of 1 squared times 82. And then you take the index variable, and you increase it by 1 again. So, and you add sine of 2 squared times 82. And you keep on doing this until you get to your end variable. So the last term will be sine of 20 squared times 82. Cool. So that's the basic version of why of how sigma notation works. The reason why this is usually better is because you don't always want to write out the full sum. Cool? Um, so let's, some kind of practice I guess. So sigma, your index variable can be something different. Let's use n equals 1 to Okay, so like you start and end variables don't have to be numbers either, they can also be variables in themselves. And I could do something like a times r to the n minus 1. Yeah. Now if you were to write this out, the first value would be what? So n is 1, a times r to the 1 minus 1, r to the 0, r to the 0 is 1, so it's a times 1, which is just a. Second term will be what? So a times r, next term will be a times r squared, up until what? So a times r to the k minus 1. And that you should recognize as a geometric series. And so you would know the formula for that, which is a times 1 minus r to the k over 1 minus r, or r to the k minus 1, r minus 1, same thing. Cool. So a lot of sums that you're used to doing and seeing can be written shorter in this way. Oh, last thing, last point I would make about this is that this is the same as like writing it like that is the same as So you can change the name of your index variable 
and the sum itself will actually stay the same. It's just like a dummy variable. It only lives as long as it's here. When you actually write it out, like when you write this out, you notice n doesn't appear anywhere there. Cool. So often when you have a long sum and you want to, you see a pattern and you want to write it in this form, you need to make up an index variable. Cool. So is there any questions about how sigma sums work about geometry proofs and things? So writing sigma notation, the sum of the first hundred natural numbers, write it. The sum of the first hundred natural numbers. Sum of all the numbers from one to n. What do you call that series? An arithmetic series. Okay, thank you for volunteering to come up. All right, so I think during that homework you gave in the last, some of you didn't do it, all right? Maybe because 
I know some of you wrote to me and said we didn't think you do it because we didn't understand the signal notation. Um, or I said, would you be able to go and try and do that proof now by induction? Right, you're welcome to send your solutions um, to us. We'll mark it for you, look at it before next week if you want to. Right. Okay, um, well, that wraps up our session three. Thank you very much for your time.